Great to have you with us, Sheikh Yasser. And please, uh, we'd love to get an update on how your mom is doing, and we're we're continuing to keep her uh, uh, in our in our du'a, inshallah. Allah barik fiq, barik Allah fiq. Alhamdulillah, she's uh, she's good. She's she's a patient woman. Bifadlillahi ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless and protect her. And you know, by the grace of Allah, you know, when you're able to live within a a theological paradigm of of genuinely knowing that you only have what you have when Allah wills that you have it, then you're able to just kind of go through the motions of the day without uh, living out the the terminality of uh, of human language. Meaning, you know, one of the themes that we've been discussing a lot as a family is only dying once, um, because sometimes we tend to. We tend to die multiple times unnecessarily. Um, when the human being will die is known. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written that when we were all in the wombs of our mothers. And uh, and so when you just let that moment happen when it's going to happen, the one time and you're able to live today as you can live today, which is in a spirited, a loving, uh, upbeat, uh, optimistic fashion, knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control, then, you know, it doesn't seem or feel as, uh, you know, dystopic, if you will, or morbid or dark or worrisome. Khalas, you know, okay, we doctors speak and say, and wallahi, if someone has, uh, Allah wills that they'll live for another day, then that person will live for another day, live for another hundred days, and that's the case, or for a hundred years. And that's and, and to be a Muslim and to know that is very liberating. So Alhamdulillah, you know, she um my mother Bifadlillah Ta'ala has been a source of of confidence for the family, you know, just grounding everyone by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh I think uh, we had our prophetic living had its actual uh, launch event the day that we found out the news. And that night um Sheikh Omar Sulaiman was at the event and Sheikh Yasir Qadi and Sheikh Yahya, Sheikh Shadi. May Allah bless them all. And um, and subhanAllah, I wanted to cancel the event, but my mother, she's the one who said, absolutely not, do not cancel. You know, keep the event. Um, you know, this is what matters. And inshallah, you know, whatever blessings are in that event for me, then may Allah grant them me. And subhanAllah, you know, the entire launch of prophetic living, I mean, it's it's prophetic living has existed for a number of years, but we always kind of stayed a little bit below the radar now we've just kind of hovered now above the radar before this launch event but uh but the whole night was for her you know the dua the spirit and so when you intend for allah allah facilitates things that you can't even fathom and uh, alhamdulillah for all of you who've been making dua for her and continue to make dua for her i pray that it's in her scale and our collective scales and you know allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests from our loved ones to assess us as individuals and and what are we going to um, what are we going to do and how are we going to act how are we going to behave um, you know so it's it's a test for the person who's sick but it's also a test for those who are you know around the sick person um, to assess uh, who are you you know what do you really believe in what do you really rely upon um, is something going to unravel you. Or are you going to withstand and grow through it? You know, and so these tests, you know, alhamdulillah, it's from the grace and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's really why I even chose this topic today, the the many shades of, of Allah's mercy. For this particular reason is that, and maybe I'll just, you know, use this to transition in slowly. Um, you know, we lose sight of, uh, we hear a lot. You know, Allah, this is a religion of mercy. The Prophet ﷺ is the prophet of mercy. He was sent as mercy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, the most gracious, the most merciful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he created this creation, he said, ar-Rahman ala al-Arsh istawa. It is, you know, ar-Rahman, the most merciful, who is the possessor of the throne. Uh, and he created this existence, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, this entire existence is created within the spectrum of Ar-Rahma, uh, Al-Ilahiyya, divine mercy and grace. In Allah, Kataba, uh, Ala Nafsihi Ar-Rahma, 
But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he prescribed upon himself mercy. He says, كَتَبْتُ عَلَى نَفْسِ الرَّحْمَةِ That mercy has been prescribed upon Allah by Allah. And he says, جَلَّ فِي عُلَى وَرَحْمَةِ سَبَقَدْ غَضَبِي And my mercy precedes my wrath. And even in the afterlife, you know, الرَّحْمَانُ عَلَى الْعَرْشِ اسْتَوَى الْمُلْكُ يَوْمَئِذٍ الْحَقُّ لِلْرَّحْمَانِ That true dominion and sovereignty on this day belongs to the most merciful. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really leads, if we can speak in these terms, leads with mercy all the time, and that we are really a religion, if there is this one marked reality that identifies it, it's rahmah. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Ya Muhammad, we now have not sent you except as a mercy to all of the worlds, not just the human being, but all of creation, all of existence. Prophet was sent as a mercy, you know, to all of it. That's why, you know, celebrate mercy is called that. Because of this, we celebrate Al-Habib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who's the mercy. So if, if, if everything is mercy, then why do we struggle so much when things are not exactly as we want them to be? See, we conceive of mercy in the more, quote-unquote, positive lens of mercy. So the mercy of um, having someone forgive you the mercy of passing a test, the mercy of escaping an accident, the mercy of being reunited with your loved one, uh, the mercy of healing, <clears throat> the mercy of getting married, the mercy of having children. You know, we, we're, we're all good with that mercy. <laughs> you know, that mercy is right in line with, you know, our feelings and conceptions of mercy and the way we believe things should be. But do we really appreciate the shades of mercy because a part of our creedal commitment fundamentally is when Allah when the Prophet tells us about the pillars of faith he says Al-Imanu an tu'mina bil qadar khayrihi wa sharri that you believe in the decree of Allah the good and the bad of it so we have a connection to the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is coming from a place of deep conviction and belief you know, that's a part of one of the pillars of our belief system and our commitments to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is I believe in your decree, Ya Allah. The, the good and that which we apparently would label as bad. But the Prophet ﷺ tells us, That astonishing is the affair of the believer. All of the affairs of the believer are good, are khair. All of them. They're all khair. Bifadlillahi ta'ala, you know. That's why, you know, everything. That nothing will come to pass in our existence except that Allah has prescribed it. Why does Allah prescribe? You know, when we when we hear a prescription in just in the language of you know medicine, a prescription is is something for your healing, for your growth, for your well-being, for your protection in the physical realm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prescribes for our welfare, for our well-being, for our own protection, our own healing, our own growth. You know, when we hear, for example, that the Prophet ﷺ says, ما يصيب المؤمن من وصب ولا هم ولا ولا حزن ولا أذى حتى الشوك يشاكها إلا كفر الله بها من خطايا. That any believer who is afflicted with any type of wasab a hardship, difficulty, concern, hem, has in sadness, harm, even the prick of a thorn, except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses that to expiate shortcomings and sins and, and mistakes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through the avenue of, of these types of difficulties, of, 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 uh, of hardship, of sadness, the things that we don't like as modern people, you know, you can argue that, Throughout humanity, no one likes hardship. But we are in an exaggerated state because a part of the modern, especially postmodern reality, uh, philosophical reality, is the, the, the fear of pain. We, we dislike it. We run from it. We think that everything must be pleasure because many philosophers have posited that, you know, that life is about maximizing pleasure and eliminating pain. And we've bought into that narrative. So pain strikes us and it unravels us. 
then we start to struggle. And that's why, you know, other faith traditions, they have the problem of evil. You know, why does God, well, if God is love, why does he do this? No, God is love by Allah's parameters and dimensions and boundaries of love Allah, and his knowledge and wisdom of what love looks like. If we know, like for example, the woman who came to the Prophet Sallallahu and she said, Ya Rasulullah, inni usra. I, I have seizures. She, a woman came, she had epileptic seizures. And she says, li, Can you make dua for me? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to her, In shi'ti da'utullah alaki. If you want, I will, I will call upon Allah for you. If that's what you want. Wa in shi'ti sabarti. وَإِنْ شِئْتِ سَبَرْتِ وَلَكِ الْجَنَّةِ That if you want, if you want, I will call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for you, and you will have what you want. You'll have the shifa, the healing that you want. But if you're patient, if you're patient, then I will give you jannah. Now this woman, what did she choose? She chose jannah. <laughs> I'll be patient, Ya Rasulullah. If the outcome is jannah, then I'll be patient. It was actually for her perhaps a no-brainer, not even in question. Wait, I just have to be patient. And I get Jannah, done. That's the option I want. <laughs> I want that option. But from her, the fullness of her ubudi, of her servanthood, is she said, Ya Allah, Ya Rasulullah, when I have these seizures, uh, ukshaf, that I'm exposed. Can you ask Allah that he just does not expose me, i.e. my body, when I have these seizures, so I remain masturam. This was her modesty and her desire to, to be committed to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a beautiful, humble manner. And, you know, for us as modern people, why is she having epileptic seizures in the first place? If God is so kind, why would he put her through that? You know, that would be our attitude. You know, why, why not just ask for healing and just get it done with? Because we have a very superficial limited scope of what mercy and ease and beauty look like. We don't like, you know, even when you have a, a beautiful painting or mosaic, there's there has to be shades. It's not just one color. What makes it beautiful are the, the multitudes of shades in it. So you have some white, you have some black, you have some red, you have some orange, right? Then you, you blend in some colors together. Sometimes it's like both black and white to create you know, a certain color, you want a certain shading. That just, it brings the whole picture to life. You know, and so we can live, yes, beautifully within divine mercy. Even if I'm being, you know, poked. <laughs> and I'm, and I'm, I'm struggling, my back hurts, my, my, um, I have health issues, uh, I lost my job. Yeah, that's mercy. That's a, that's a, that's a coloring of mercy. When the Prophet ﷺ says, Astonishing is the affair of the believer. All of the affairs of a believer are khair, are good. Why? Because it opens up doors now. Because once, okay, decree comes upon me. When decree comes my way, doors are opened. If something good happens, Prophet ﷺ, if something good happens, I thank Allah. I enter into a state of a distinct type of worship, which is shukr. One of the, the most important dispositions of the believer, shakir lillah. That's why Allah juxtaposes shukr with kufr. Imma shakiran wa imma kafura. I'm thankful. You know, because he says, you're either one who's thankful or you're someone who's kafur, i.e. you reject. You're not cognizant of God, divine, God, divine grace. So something good happens. You know, I get the job that I want. I, I get a nice check in the mail. Um, I eat a nice meal. Whatever the case is, I travel to a, to a medina. I'm sure, alhamdulillah, shukrulillah, I feel so blessed, so, but then hardship hits, you lose a loved one, you have an illness, you lose your job, you know, you have a divorce, it opens up another window, a window of sabr, a window of patience, patience, sabru, nisfu iman half of iman, half of our belief is patience, so Allah says, Fasbir sabran jamila. Let your patience be beautiful. Engage in beautiful patience. Fasbir wa sabir wa rabitu. Be patient. 
and be perseverant in your patience and tie yourself down and be steadfast. You know, weather the storms. Yes, there's storms. The dunya, storms. We're going to test you, Allah says, with good. Because good tests come in the color of that which is good and tests come in the color of that which is bad. And sometimes that which is bad is what leads exactly to what is best. And sometimes that which is good leads to that which is worst. And and everything in between. SubhanAllah. And we must never lose sight of this. So when we're embracing the decree of Allah, we know that this decree, whatever color it is, is purely from His mercy. Wallahi l'azim. There are people who will arrive to the highest... Look at Sayyidah Sumayya. Sayyidah Sumayya was a woman who lived in terms of, in, with our colloquial, a hellish life. Hellish by every you know, measure of that word. From slavery, bondage, abuse, torture, torment, everything. And she committed herself to the way of La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, and that brought the greatest form of hardship and struggle and, 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 and suffering that a human being could experience. And she was brutalized into martyrdom. And now we sing the praises of Sayyidul Sumayya. She is from the highest women of Jannah. We talk about her in the most honorific of terms, the first martyr in Islam. We speak about her so lovingly, so endearingly, those from those early believers who converted and came into the space and entered in and submitted and surrendered and, and believed. And they braved, you know, the storm that came their way of decree because it was stormy. In the life of Sayyidah Sulmaya, it was stormy. But what did it result in? It resulted in the highest levels. Can you not conceive of everything she went through within the scope of mercy? It's a color. It's a color. And it was customized for her. Do you think Sayyidah Sumaya is in Jannah right now or in that elevated station complaining about what she went through in life? You and I are. Why would she have to go there? Do you think Sayyidah Sumaya is asking why when she sees the result? The result of her patience, the result of her perseverance, the result of her acceptance. You know, I was, I was telling my mother about uh, Suhaib Sultan, rahmatullahi alayhi, uh, brother, you know, Imam Suhaib, who was uh, beloved to many here, and it says uh, Sidi Tariq was there in his last breaths, and Sidi Tariq was reading for him Surah Yasin. And uh, during the janazah, one of the brothers, Brother Nuri, uh, Friedlander, he said, he said, you know, and I'll never forget this, it was such a profound statement. He said, So Hype started this journey as a sinner and he ended it as a saint. His, his journey through cancer. He started as a sinner and he exited this world as a saint. This is our good opinion of our dear brother that we in the light, he ended this life, ended for him in the best of states. You know, and of course, our good opinion is that bi he is in the best of, of ahwar, that he is in, in, in a graceful reality. He's not over there on the other side, if you will, missing and looking and even wanting to see his daughter. No, he's in bliss. He is in a different reality. Hadith subhanAllah, some of the athar say that when this person dies and passes, people on the other side are going to come wanting to get some akhbar. This is some athar, you know, that what, tell us about what's happening over there. So, uh, you know, others will say, hey, just give him time to relax. Give her time to relax. It just came out of that thing called the dunya, <laughs> you know. Let them relax now. It's understanding Allah's mercy is understanding the scope of the divine, which is endless. You know, we cannot limit mercy to those pleasure-inducing realities that our simple nafsani dispositions have become accustomed with. That when I have more, I eat more, I possess more, oh, that's mercy. When I get what I want, that's mercy. No. That you could have someone who really messed around a lot in this dunya and has a lot to account for. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala afflicts them with something that cleanses them and purifies them. You know, that's why the Prophet ﷺ, a man was saying, لا بارك الله في الحمى. 
Humma is, is feverishness. So the Prophet says, لا تسب الحمى فإنها مكفرة للذنوب والخطايا. Don't ever curse a fever. Don't ever curse a fever because it is what expiates sins and removes heart and, and removes uh, you know mistakes. Prophet says, لا يزال البلاء بالمؤمن في أهله وماله ووالده حتى يلقى الله وما عليه خطية. That you'll have a bala or hardship that is, you know, sometimes people come to me and they'll say about the extent of their hardships and how long it's been with them. You know, the Prophet says that you have a hardship with you that's kind of stuck like an appendage now. You know, it's, you've been trying to get rid of that appendage, but it's not going anywhere. Well, that bala is with you, let's say. With you, your family, your many, etc., your child, until you meet Allah. And then you'll find that that one appendage that you were trying to get rid of the whole time was the reason you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you have no sins to account for. And I know I know all of us listening, some, this resonates, I know. Like We've been trying to, much of our agony and our sadness and our pain and our struggle and our despair and our anxiety is because I just want to get rid of this one appendage. If this appendage that's attached on that I don't want, just I can just get rid of it, everything is going to be better. But you know from Allah's mercy, He doesn't get rid of it from, from you for that reason. Because He knows <laughs> what you need. We don't make good decisions. I, I, I khutbah today that I gave here in New Jersey and ICPC was about the choices we make. We very often make poor choices. From Allah's rahmah. That sometimes he impresses upon us realities. Now listen, we ask Allah for afiyah, we ask Allah for ease, we ask him for wellness, we ask him for healing as an act of worship. But what Allah wants for us is the best. It's the most merciful. It will ensure the best circumstances for us in this life and the next. Yeah, we should be proactive in calling upon Allah and asking, Ya Allah, walakin, as he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, walakin na'afiyataka hiya aw sa'udi, Ya Rasul, Ya Allah, I, you know, I do not reject your decree. However, your uh, wellness and relief is more expansive for me. So we ask Allah for those things. But it does not contradict for a second the theological underpinning of that which Allah wills for us is what is best. It's mercy. That the illness, the loss, all of it can be the reason why I'm elevated to the highest of heights, given perhaps the station of wilaya, you know, closeness to Allah. A person who dies from an uh, illness of the stomach, this person is, martyr, is a martyr. One of my shaykh, may Allah have mercy upon him, Sheikh Imad, who was martyred in Egypt, uh, You know, his wife, his wife told us afterwards, his number one du'a was martyrdom. He just wanted to die as a martyr. And he was martyred. He was shot to death. SubhanAllah. You know, that's a, that's a, I mean, for the most pious of pious believers, martyrdom is the ultimate desire. Just, just want to be martyred. Meaning that I die fi sabilillah. Really. Well, here you can have, you know, an auntie, a loved one who who dies as a martyr is gifted the highest form of death martyrdom through the illness that afflicts is that not allah's mercy you know his auntie they didn't go out on the battlefield or <laughs> sitting in their house but they received the station of martyrdom through an illness that came into their being is that not mercy wallahi it's mercy we That's why, alhamdulillah, we don't have a problem. We don't have the problem of evil. Why does God do this? No, 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 no. Because our theology liberates us. It's so beautiful to be a Muslim. Wallahi al-Azim, you know, I, over this past year in general, because my mother had a, a big surgery last year, a very different thing. It was a whole other thing. I think we even made dua for her here last year. But I've been spending a lot of time in the hospitals and rehabilitation facilities and ICUs and And, you know, different type of like specialist medical centers that you see a lot of death, a lot of pain. You see the fragility of the human condition. And I cannot stop but think and say, Alhamdulillah for Islam. Wallahi, the most liberating, beautifying, uplifting reality in our existence is the mercy of Islam. It's mercy. 
allows you to thrive through the most impenetrable hardships, but you thrive through it and you grow and you, you're you enriched and you're nourished. And everything, that's why Sayyiduna Ayyub, they talk about the patience of Job. Sayyiduna Ayyub, he, he castigated his wife when she tried to ask him to say, can't you ask God to relieve us a little bit? And he said, no way. You know, he was in a very different elevated station, but his, what he saw, what he knew through that prophetic lens is, are all of the blessings of my existence are coming through these hardships because he lost it all. He had many children, 12 plus. He lost all of his children. He had endless acreage of land and property and vegetation. He lost it all. Illness, he was healthy, full health. He was riddled with every type of disease. And no complaint, why? Because he experienced it as mercy. He knew that divine grace was coming at him through this reality. And so he embraced it to the fullest and he thrived through it and he grew and he he becomes for us the prophet of patience. <laughs> Sayyiduna Ayyub. So brothers and sisters, you know, I, I can say so much more, Wallahi, but I'll, I, I, I think I'm, I'm supposed to wrap up. I can see, so I'll wrap up. But I pray that we're able to see how, and and, and, and we see it by surrendering, by the way. Because if you and I can't surrender, we won't see. Do you understand what I'm saying here? That the reason why we don't see it is because we won't stop looking at what we want. Like, you know, sometimes you'll, our children, they'll become hyper fixated on this. I want this toy. I want this toy. I want this toy. And I'm trying to show them a much better toy, a much better piece of candy. But no, no, I want this one. You become fixated. That all of my pleasure and all of what I need and all is in this. Well, come here and see that. And it's so much better. You know, it pains me to watch people in the public sphere today. Wallahi, like, you know, public, the word mercy is thrown around in the public sphere a lot. Love, compassion. These words have been thrown around, used and abused and misused in the most egregious of ways. And everyone assumes that mercy exists within their purview when they get what they want. And that is a very wrong idea. It's almost exactly the opposite most of the time that no mercy is not when I get what I want mercy is when Allah decrees for me and shows me and guides me to what is really best for me because I don't know what what perspective do I have you know we think now because our world has become so thoroughly secularized and the human being has become God and everyone assumes that the epitome of their own individual existence is the extent to which they have what they want and they will fight for it we should be celebrating our desires and our wants and we should be validated and we should fight and it should be plastered everywhere. And, and we think that that's some idea of mercy and it has nothing to do with mercy. It has everything to do with ego and desire. You know, and, and, and that's just the truth of it. You know, yeah, but a merciful life for a person may very well be that I live my whole life really wanting something and not having it and not being able to or being or struggling with a desire or struggling with a loss or struggling with a pain or struggling with an illness and it never being lifted from upon me. And that may be the exact path of mercy that I need to achieve the highest levels of bounty in the afterlife. So I pray that Allah inspires us all to see the many colors of divine mercy to see the beautiful mosaic that we don't that we're no longer you know superficial and we have these simple binaries good bad you know and we we we, we just come obsessed about good and we can't stand the idea of bad no that we just see it as a beautiful <laughs> mosaic and a, and a beautiful painting with colors and shades and Allah comes this way we you know it comes at us this way that way from up from the bottom and we're like, Allahu Akbar. You know, the story is so much more profound, so much more rich. We want to be like that woman who had epilepsy and she saw the akhirah and said, yeah, well, anything here, I have my eye there. So I'm going to embrace it here because I'm going to be there. And then when all is said and done and we're in the afterlife and we see the mosaic, we see it play out, I say, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, the greatest blessing of my life was that I lost that job. The greatest blessing of my life was that earthquake, the greatest blessing of my life
was that loss or that illness. People will say that, subhanAllah. And there's a hadith that support this. I just don't have time to get into it because I'm, I think, five minutes over time now. But there's a hadith that support that. The people look back and say, the greatest blessing of my life was that debilitating illness. SubhanAllah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be merciful with us and be kind with us and gentle and compassionate. And may He give us the fortitude and the strength to embrace His mercy as He wills it for us. We ask Allah for afiyah and ease and wellness in our lives. We don't want the dunya to be a fitna for us, certainly. We want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us wisdom, hikmah, and understanding, fiqh and fahm in our deen. And he give us perspective, and he expand our horizons, and he allows us to see with the lens of the akhirah, so that this dunya, we experience it and we negotiate it beautifully by his grace and his mercy. Allahumma ameen, barakallahu feekum. وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين. Ameen, Ameen, Jazakallah khair. We wish you could keep going. Uh, this lesson has been, alhamdulillah, a great blessing. I, I'll just quickly share a comment here from our sister Rashida who said, I needed this talk today. Thank you so much, Sheikh Yasid. May Allah bless you and elevate you in this life and the next and grant your mom uh, complete healing and shifa. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, um, we are going to just have some two quick announcements, inshallah, before before I bring you back onto the stage. Uh, Sheikh Yasser Fahmi, um, I'm going to just quickly, we do have a Q&A session. So inshallah, we'll, we'll be able to squeeze in a few questions. So please uh, feel free to to drop some in the in the chat or to email questions at celebratemercy.com. But before we begin that, I just wanted to direct your attention to two quick announcements. One, we are going to be having Days of Divine Love. This is a very special um, webinar that will be happening this Sunday, this Sunday, June 18th. As you can see here, alhamdulillah, we have a wonderful lineup of speakers, of teachers, who will be uh, sharing some stories and some practical advice for the first 10 days of the Hijjah. So we do invite you to go to celebratemercy.org slash DDL uh, to, to, to RSVP. Uh, and we hope that you can also share this with your friends and family so that they can also join us. And I also just wanted to quickly turn your attention to uh, some of the programming that we're going to be having uh, during the Hijjah. As you can see, we have some daily programs, the Surat Yasin and Morning Vic. We have some kids series. We have the Friday Gems, of course, continuing as well as a nightly uh, series on, um, as you can hear titled Sincerity and Sacrifice. We have some campaigns and of course the standalone webinars. So inshallah, we, we have quite a bit happening during these first uh, 10 days of the Hijjah. We invite you to go to celebratemercy.org slash DH so that you can learn more about the individual programs um, as well as RSVP to, to attend. And with that, inshallah, I'm going to uh, welcome Sheikh Yasser back to the stage and, and get started on, on the Q&A. Uh, we have a few questions that came in uh, through the chat as well as through the email. So let me just quickly pull this up. Uh, the first one was actually about um, in terms of practical. So what are some practical ways to cultivate a deep sense of gratitude for the mercy of Allah in our, in our hearts and our lives? <laughs> Go for it. Myself. <laughs> <laughs> you should give it a shot. Um, um, so, Bismillah. I think first I would say that you know the 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 way in which we understand we 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 cultivate a deep sense of of gratitude and uh, understanding of divine mercy is through immersing ourselves in the divine. Um, we have to develop a deeper and more intimate familiarity with who Allah is, um, and the more you get to know Allah. And you really understand um, his names and his attributes and his actions and how he commands and why. And and just it's you know endless. Allah's names are obviously endless, and you understand his name Al Latif, his name Al Qadir, his name Al Alim, Al Hafiz. You you learn these names and attributes, and you develop a familiarity. Then your ability to conceive of divine mercy extends well beyond the simple superficial prism of, of, of pleasure. So that's number one, you know, develop a, a knowledge of Allah. Number two is immerse yourself in, in, in worship. You know, in, in when, when you're reading the book of Allah, when you're making dua, when you're praying, when you're making your dhikr, 
your daily litanies of remembrance. You're saying La ilaha illallah at least a hundred times a day. You're saying Astaghfirullah at least a hundred times a day. You're saying Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad at least a hundred times a day. When this is happening, then you are, then you're immersing yourself in in a, a, a discourse, if you will, and a thought track and a talk track that, that Im, imprints in your spirit, in your mind, the mercy of Allah. You know, because so often the reason why we don't experience mercy or we don't think about mercy because our talk track and what we're busy with is very negative. You know, so you'll get a phone call from a friend, a family member, and they'll talk to you very negatively about, oh, that's so unfortunate you're going through. And you ha end up having a, people, a lot of people who enable you and who validate every negative emotion and thought that you have. And so that can be very often the worst thing that it, you, it limits you from cultivating or feeling that grace and understanding and having that gratitude. So you want to, you know, you, Quran, study the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in such a profound way to, to develop this idea of mercy, the, the, the many colors of mercy, the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, because you see, you see every color every color in the in the spectrum you see it in the life of al habib sallallahu alaihi wasallam and i've said this many times if you want to heal you really want to heal not just you know begrudgingly get over a problem or for, you know forget about it no i mean heal that's still there but you're thriving now read the life of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam study his life sallallahu alaihi wasallam so you know through learning about allah really get developing an intimate familiarity with him jalla fi ula through proactive, you know, uh, uh, acts of worship of all of their kind, and immersing yourself in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I think these are three practical ways to cultivate um, the sensibility. Inshallah. Jazakallah khair for that response. Um, I'll share another one here from the chat. Um, it says, "How do we navigate the fact that we still want to achieve things, um, and I guess, but not, uh, but avoid being caught up in the dunya? I don't want to be that child who only wants that toy." <laughs> yeah, I mean, listen. Uh, yeah, what I would say is this: it's all about intention. You know, where are you going? Um, in the hadith of where the Prophet speaks about your hijrah. If your hijrah, if your journey is to get a piece of the dunya, you know, to get some family, some money, some status, then that's what you'll get out of the dunya. But if your journey in life is for the sake of Allah and His Messenger, then that's what your journey will be for. And so, you know, we as people who quote unquote live in the first world, you know, and I'm very. Uh, you know, I struggle with those terms, but we'll just use them. But you live in the first world, and you could have one of first world problems. The fact that we can even pursue the dunya and get, and like know that it's accessible to us, and I can get more, it's in and of itself a luxury. You know, the majority of people on Earth don't have that luxury. I have family members in different parts of the world who they live off of dollars a day in their serve and they're and and you know there's no they don't have the luxury of having more of the dunya it's just not accessible there's not <laughs> you know there's no, there's nothing being passed around no matter what they what job they have or whatever it's just so you know you have to be careful about how trapped you and I may be in in the dunya because it, it may may have tantalized us much more than we understand with that said you know, you have to understand your your actual purpose in life. You and I have to understand our purpose in life. What we're meant to be doing with our days and our nights. Not, as I've said many times in this own this platform, not that I do, I live my life and then I try to grandfather Allah into the equation and say, oh yeah, yeah, all this, I'm going to rubber stamp Allah and for the sake of Allah, no, no. Saying that you really spend time thinking, what is the best way for Yasser to live, for Fatima to live? What's the best way for me to to live out this existence with this circumstance, this network that I have, these family members that I have, these access points that I have? What's the best way for me to live? And then I I I, I walk down that path. And to do that, you have to consult. By the way, and don't just consult friends. Don't consult the internet. No, consult. 
wise elders, consult teachers, mashayikh. What's the, what's the best way for me to live? And in that path, let's say you have, you, it becomes accessible for you to have a nice car. Alhamdulillah. Bismillah, drive your nice car. That you can have this nice apartment or a nice house. Alhamdulillah. You know, it's a nice thing. Bifadlillah. Alhamdulillah. You know, enjoy it as you have it. But you're not tied into it. You don't need it. If it goes away, you're not going to, you know, unravel. You'll go back to your simple existence of a servant of Allah and you'll be very happy. So it's it's just a matter of having a drive, a purpose. The thing is, so much of us, the dunya really takes up. That's why we have this important dua. Allahumma la taj'al dunya akbar hammina wa la mablagh ilmina. Ya Allah, don't make the dunya my biggest concern or the extent of my knowledge. For a lot of us, because of the, 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 the consumerist nature of our existence, that we're, it's really been ingrained in us how important money is, how important material belongings are. And we don't even have, our knowledge is limited to this stuff and it hasn't extended beyond. So we have to see, we have to learn much more. You know, why would some of the pious predecessors dig graves in their backyards? <laughs> well, why? They would dig grave and they would put, you know, the, the little tablet with their names on it. And they would say, Hada maqarruk. this is your abode. This is where you belong. Why would they do that? Was it where they were the morbid, dark people? No. They were some of the liveliest, most illuminated people to ever walk on this earth. But their scope of knowledge and understanding and pursuits was far more profound. They didn't, they didn't really taste the pleasure of having things. It didn't, or let's just say the superficiality of whatever pleasure enjoys in things paled in comparison to the richness and the pleasure and the joy and the upliftment and the thriving of, of, of a session of dhikr, for example, gathering together with your brothers and sisters and making dhikr. So challenge yourself to have pursuits. You know, everyone here should be having dhikr as a constant part of their daily existence. Cut, gather together as families, as community members. Make dhikr. Watch. You know, we, we a group of us here in northern New Jersey, we gather in a gathering of dhikr and fikr every Thursday night. And it's the kids thriving the kids love the dhikr and fikr more than anyone else <laughs> you know but you have to have you have to have a vision a purpose an intention for your life and that gives you that makes it where you're just not focused on this one toy but it's it's all it's all profound like for example i i'm, I'm i know I'm, I'm kind of going on a little bit too long but i'll stop with this there's more that i want to say but i'll just stop which is you know sometimes we really struggle with the idea of serving those around us Serving my mother, serving my father, serving my husband, serving my wife, serving my children, serving my home, serving my community. We don't, the standard disposition is people find this as just an egregious burden. Why should I have to do this for people? Why should I have to do it when others don't have? Well, if we understood the virtue of service, we understood the purposefulness of service as one of the most illustrious dispositions that a follower of the Messenger وسلم, can embody. The most beloved of people in the sight of Allah are those who bring the most benefit to people. Wallahi, if we understood this, we'd be running trying to figure out how we can serve. To take care of my family, take care of my friends, take care of my community. To cook, to clean, to prepare, to spend, to buy. To, 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 to give whatever I have in the spirit of and the path of khidmah that is a rich life but the average person today views that as something you should run away from and it's like why should I have to I don't want to have to out of all of my siblings why should I have to out of this well, how come uh, men this and women that and we start to make these empty equivalencies and comparisons no Figure out every person sitting here, all of us have to figure out how can I maximize two things. My ubudiyya lillah wal khidma li khalqihi. My servanthood to Allah and the khidma, the service of his creation. That's, that's how you live the best possible life. You know, so this is how you extend. This is why, subhanAllah, you'll, you'll have that toy that you really want. You know, I'll just take the... <laughs> Example full circle. You will have that toy that you want. 
And from because you have the spirit of khidna so embedded within you, someone comes to you and says, hey, I like that toy. You say, Fadl, here, it's yours. You love it? Take it. You like it? Here, take it. It's yours. Because you have, I don't know, you want my home? Take my home. Why? We, we can reach a point. You, you, need, you need a car? Take my car. What are you going to use? Oh, I'll, I'll, you, I, my wife and I have a car. We'll, we'll, we'll make do. You take this car. You can develop that. You can develop that spirit and you can live a rich life. You know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and guide us. Ya Rabbi Alameen. Sorry for that. I know it was a little bit too long. <laughs> I mean, I mean, no, Jazakallah khair. Please don't apologize for, for the, the length of responses. Alhamdulillah, there's so many people commenting about, um, you know, just their appreciation for your, your full responses. I will, I will pose one more if that's okay. Yeah. Um, I've lost it here in the chat. Oh, here it is. Um, his brother is asking, I try to motivate myself by saying Allah will accept my du'as. Can I say that even knowing that Allah might not grant it? Well, I want to tell, his name was Ahmed, I think. I want to tell Brother Ahmed the following. It's important and, and critical for you to understand that Allah accepts all du'a. Um, and yes, you should be motivated by that. 100%. We should all be motivated. Du'a is, a du'a huwa al-ibadah. Prophet Sallam says, if worship is anything, it is du'a, calling upon Allah, saying, Ya Allah, Ya Allah. Allah describes those who do not say, Ya Allah, do not make du'a. He describes them as being arrogant. In the ladina yastakbiruna an ibadati. So making du'a and knowing that Allah accepts is essential. Now, subhanAllah, he, he used himself, the brother of the questioner, used accept and grant, <laughs> which is very important. May Allah bless you. Because, yes, Allah accepts all du'a, but he may not grant you what, I, what you want. And that's fine. That's because, see, accepting the fact that it may not be granted is a, an acceptance of the fact that I don't know what's really best. That's why people say, please, Sheikh, make du'a. I really need to get into this program. And I, I, I cannot tell you how this is one of the most common adaya that I'm requested for. I just need to get into I need to pass these tests. And it's this young, miskeen, 20-something-year-old person who's just who thinks that their whole life <laughs> hinges upon whether or not they get into this medical program or pass their LSATs or their MCATs or their SATs or their CLP, whatever, every, all the acronyms you want. And my whole life depends on this. <laughs> Habibi, Habibti, my brother, my sister, my loved one, <laughs> say, may Allah grant you what's best. <laughs> it does not make... Of course, you know, I, I have to appreciate the fact that this person is, you know, discombobulating in front of me and losing it and has been pulling out their hair for the past, you know, months, worrying, anxiety ridden. But mashallah, they've also been doing a lot of worship. <laughs> I always tell people, like when exam time comes, like the uptick of worship is profound. Just people are crying into the night. And then once the test is passed or whatever, <laughs> Stock price you know, starts to plummet. The stock of du'a starts to plummet. You know, so uh, accepting the fact that yeah, you have to make du'a. You know, we make du'a. Ya Allah, Allahumma shfi, Allahumma shfina. Ya Allah, shifa. You are anta shafi. Allahumma rabbi nas alhi bil bas. Shfi anta shafi. La shifa illa shifa. Ok shifa la yawadu saqa. We make that du'a, and we make it as an act of ibadah, and we have. Conviction that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts the dua and hears the dua and that he will be latif and kind. And then that's it. That dua has been lifted and it did its job. And khalas, you leave it. Now what Allah then decrees and facilitates and carves out and the pathway and what it's going to look like, just sit back and watch the show. Let it pass. Let, it, let Allah do. Not let. You're not, we're not letting Allah do anything. Let it be in the sense of, because w what will be is exactly what Allah will make it be. You know, it's going to be what Allah wants it to be. Because he possesses kun fayakun, be and it is. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to, to always run to him. Fafirru ila Allah. May we always call upon Allah. May we always beg Allah. Ud'uhu tadarru'an wa khufya. May we always call upon Allah in the most humble of dispositions. We beg and ask. We have certainty and conviction that he responds and accepts our dua. And then whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills for us, we are so thankful to Allah for everything he wills for us. Alhamdulillah.
الله أعلم بارك الله فيكم وجزاكم الله خيرا